So I welcome everyone that is here. We will get started. It is four o'clock. I hope my screen is visible to everyone out there. This. Okay. So hello everyone and I welcome you all to week 12 of the introduction to development with biology. PMR of MPTL session. This is the 12th week we are doing it, and today is the last week we this today is the last session. And uh, throughout the course, if you have seen the previous videos or attended the sessions, you know that the PMR of MPTL sessions are designed in a way so that a uh, PMR fellow such as myself can go through various assignment problems of that week's MPTL course so that uh, we can interactively solve the assignment problems along with the students. And this will not only help the students to better understand the how to approach the problem, but also will give them an understanding of the course material that was involved throughout the week. So let me get uh, go ahead with my introduction. My name is Anup Chatterjee. I'm a PMRF fellow and PhD scholar under the supervision of Professor Junaki Sen at the Brain Developmental Biology Lab, Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. So in this particular week, we in the course we had dealt majorly with evolutionary developmental biology and learns about learned about various modes of of how the evolution occurs via looking uh, via looking at four major variations of the theme, which were heterotopy, heterometry, heterochrony, and heterotypy. And then we moved on a bit towards various epigenetic modes of inheritance and that is what we will deal with today as well. So let us go ahead with the first question. Which of the following is or are the causes for the development of shells in turtles? Okay, I hope I am audible again. So uh, we come back to the question that we are going to answer. The question is, which of the following is or are the causes for development of shells in turtles? The options are gradual accumulation of variations leading to a new allele of BMP that is bone morphogenesis protein, expression of BMP in a new location, expression of FGF10 in the dermal region or allometric changes in the expression of BMP. This is a box type of answer because uh, and thus it is uh, there are more than one options that are correct. I would like everyone to try and answer this. So let us look at the solution slide and try to better understand the problem. So this is a typical example of heterotopy, that is changing location of a gene's expression. So expression of FGF10 in the dermal region. So ordinarily FGF10 is not expressed in the dermal region in normal in vertebrates, but in turtles especially, FGF10 expression is seen in the dermal region as well, as you can see right here. It's an in situ hybridization image. Uh, that is shown right here in which we can see FGF10 here is a so this is a probably a uh, this is probably a bright field image and this is the in situ hybridization image or uh, which can in which you can show, see the FGF10 localization to the dermal regions 
and the FG10 what it does is it attracts ribs or bones towards itself so it attracts the precursor of bone forming cells towards itself and as you can see the ribs which ordinarily in vertebrates cover the thoracic region instead of folding in uh, onto the ventral side they are being attracted towards the dermal region as you can see right here so the rib extends along the dermal region what happens next is that the precursors of bone forming cells go ahead and release bmp so that they can form bone and bmp is thus this dermal region also now comes into contact with bmp since they are not normally accustomed to bmp and are competent in the presence of bmp to form bone they also solidify, solidify and form bone and thus the entire dermal region of the turtle changes to bone and we can see right here the another picture that shows us using alizarin red staining the bone formation in the turtle shell so this is what, how it happens so fgf10 present in the dermal region attracts the ribs precursor cells towards itself rib precursor cells release bmp BMP or in, uh, when the dermal cells come in contact with BMP, they change to bone as well, and thus the turtle shell is formed. And here we have the here we have the caption to the entire image. Uh, this uh, figure shows the heterotopy on several levels in turtle development. The carapace of the dorsal shell of the turtle is formed through sequential layers of heterotopies. FGF10 expression in certain regions of dermis impels rib precursor cells to migrate laterally into the dermis instead of forming a rib cage. So the first level of heterotopy is the uh, expression of FGF10 in the dermal tissue system, which is not normally present there. Next, uh, the second level of heterotopy is the expression of BMP10 in the dermal region, which is also not expressed there, which is brought about by the ribs. So both of these events together for help in the formation of the turtle shell. Thus, when we go ahead and try and answer this question, which of the following is or are the causes for development of shells in turtles? The answers are expression of BMP in a new location and expression of FGF10 in the dermal region. So if no one has any, any questions, we will go ahead with the next one. The next question is What kind of changes in Sonic Hedgehog, SHHT Sonic Hedgehog expression will prevent eye development in vertebrates? The options are heterometric changes, heterotypic changes, heterotopic changes, or heterochronic changes. What changes in Sonic Hedgehog expression will prevent eye development in vertebrates? So, here we can see. Uh, image which uh, shows us the sonic edge of how sonic edge of separates the eye field into bilateral fields so ordinarily what happens is fact six so uh, what happens is fact six as we have seen earlier also is responsible for eye formation it is expressed throughout this dorsal region of the forebrain but what uh, but sonic edge of is expressed in the middle of it in this region and it inhibits the action of PAC6 in order to form eyes. And thus, even though PAC6 is expressed throughout, this portion does not form any eye. So we have the eye field is separated into two. So we have two eyes or bilateral eye field. When sonic expression is uh, less, what happens is that the eye field separation is lower. And thus we see the eye fields come closer. And if there is no expression here, you can see that there is only one optical vesicle forming, and uh, thus sonic hedgehog uh, sub, uh, does not, is not able to suppress the pac 6 and only one eye field is forming. And thus sonic hedgehog separates the eye field by suppressing pac 6 in the center. When sonic hedgehog is inhibited by gerbine alkaloid, so we have discussed that gerbine alkaloid is one of the inhibit uh, can inhibit uh, sonic hedgehog, and this gives rise to the Phenotype cyclopia, that is one eye, and this is how that one eye is formed. No sonic edge means that a pack is not inhibited in the center, 
if sorry say parasites is not inhibited in center the i field do not separate into two and we have only one i for it thus the kind of changes in sonic hedgehog expression that will prevent i development in vertebrates is heterometric changes that is change in the amount of sonic hedgehog lower amount of sonic hedgehog will like, turn uh, will cause lower uh, will cause less separation in the i field and if there is no sonic hedgehog at all we will get the cyclopia phenotype in which only one i forms so that was about this question so we move ahead the next is which of the following is or are examples of allometry so allometry is a type of heterometry uh, that we will just look at in the next slide but the options regarding this particular question is that the types of examples of allometry are longer central toes of mammals one toed feet of horses blow hole or nose on the top of the whale head an elongated beak of the cactus finch these are the four options that are given and uh, this is a box type of answer so there is more than one option that is correct so i would like everyone to try and answer this okay so let us try and answer this questions by first learning what exactly is allometry so allometry is a type of heterometry that is a uh, heterometry as we just discussed it is changes in amount of gene expression but allometry is a special type of heterometry in which different parts develop at different rates that is uh, this type of heterometry uh, so allometry is a type of heterometry that affects the growth rate of different parts of an organism and in this, in this, the gene expression is directly related to how fast a part will grow with respect to the others. Examples of allometric changes, or allometry, or uh, is the head of the wheel, the single toe of the horse, and the longer central toe in mammals. So we will be discussing the first part, the first example, in order to understand what exactly allometry is. So this is a human skull, and you can see this orange-colored bone is the maxilla portion, that is the upper jaw portion. Ordinarily, this is how the entire structure sh should develop. But in case of waves, what happens is, till one point, the growth rates of the other structure is the same. But after a point, the growth rate of maxilla, maxilla increases exponentially. So we have this particular part uh, growing at a huge rate. This particular part growing at a huge rate means that it will cause it will cause an elongation of this part. And we have a structure uh, that forms that uh, in case of wheels, where the maxilla is flatter and horizontal with respect to the uh, face. And what it does is, since this part is growing at a faster rate, it also pushes the blowhole or the nose of the wheels towards the top. And this gives them an evolutionary advantage that now the wheels do not have to turn to the side or turn completely onto one end in order to breathe as you can have if you have seen whales when they come to the surface to breathe they breathe directly through the uh, their blowhole without turning a bit so they uh, this kind of allometry gives them an evolutionary advantage by changing the growth rate of the maxilla in this picture we have not shown the mandible that is the lower jaw but uh, only the maxilla is shown so that the importance can be signified so this is what is known as allometry. Similarly, single toe of horses is also allometric change so that the middle toe of, in case of horses, it grew, grew so fast compared to the others the, the, that only one toe is now visible throughout the uh, throughout horses. Similarly, in case of mammals, the central toe in uh, the central toe it grows at a faster rate and thus it is longer than other fingers of or toes of mammals so that was all we have to discuss about allometry and which of the following is or are examples of allometry it includes the longer central toe of mammals the one toed feet of horses and the blue hole or nose on top of whale head 
elongated beak of cactus finch does not qualify because it is a different kind of heterometric change but not a allometric change. So that was what we had to discuss in this question. Yeah. So we move forward. Why do centipedes and millipedes have a lot more legs than drosophila? So that is a very basic question. So why do in some insects have six legs and why do others have eight? And why do centipedes and millipedes especially have a lot more legs than others? So the options regarding that is UBX or ultrabithorax is expressed in all segments of centipedes and millipedes. Distal list is not expressed in the abdominal segments of drosophila. Differences in segmentation patterns between the two groups and distal list is expressed in all segments of centipedes and millipedes. Is a round type of question or so only one option is correct. I would like again to answer this. Okay, we'll go on and try and answer this using this particular solution slide. So, uh, this slide shows us the how the expression of ultrabithorax protein and the protein sequence itself for ultrabithorax uh, plays a major role in the Expression uh, it plays a major role in expression of another gene distal list, and both of them together play a role in how many legs the insect can have. So, why a heterotypic chain in which the kind of protein or the protein itself changes? There have been, as you can see, a polyalanine stretch being introduced into particular set of insects which have six legs that is, fly, mosquito, butterfly, moth, beetle, drosophila, everyone. They have a polyalanine stretch. So, a change in uh, protein sequence that occurred between them, probably somewhere here, by uh, way earlier in the evolutionary line or phylogenetic tree, that caused them to have polyalanine stretch. Whereas other organisms, such as the centipede, millipede, or uh, spiders, do not have this polyalanine stretch. Although the homeodomain or the, uh, of the ultrabithorax, uh, gene is conserved, this part is additional in case of these insects, Roxpilla, mosquito, or butterfly. What happens is that this particular polyanaline stretch allows ultrabiothorax to inhibit another protein known as distalness. So, only in insects, ultrabiothorax protein can inhibit distalness gene, and distalness is responsible for the formation of legs. And thus, as ultrabithorax is expressed in the abdomen uh, seg segments of all these insects, uh, ultrabithorax inhibits distalless gene there, and thus the abdominal segments do not produce legs, and only thoracic segments do, and thus only uh, drosophila or butterfly, these uh, insects only have six legs. And this is all due to the polyanaline stretch present near the C terminus of the uh, polyanaline stretch uh, present in the C terminus of the uh, insects. So that is how the, uh, this is an example of polytypy that is change in the protein sequence itself. So why do centipedes and millipedes have a lot more legs than drosophila? It is because distal less is not expressed in abdominal segments of drosophila. So if that is okay, we will go and go ahead and move forward. This is the next question. Suppression of limb growth in abdominal segments in arthropods is due to the options are heterometry, changes in the amino acid sequence of proteins involved in development of limbs, different rates of growth for the limbs and the abdominal segments, and heterotypy. So this is a box type of answer. So there is more than one option that is correct. Okay, so move forward and try and answer this. We again have. Uh, so this is the same question that just asked in a different way. So wh what is the reason for suppression of limb growth in abdominal segments of arthropods? It is this polyanaline stretch which is present in these insects 
and this is an example of heterotypy and thus uh, the correct options are changes in amino acid sequence of proteins involved in development of limb that is the ultrabiothorax and this is an example of heterotypy so we move forward which of the following is or are responsible for prolactin expression in uterine epithelial cells of placental mammals the options are spatial changes in foxo 1a expression temporal changes in foxo 1a expression amino acid changes in hox a11 or spatial temporal changes in hox a11 expression so the protein prolactin is responsible for essential development of placenta in uh, special development of placenta in all placental mammals and thus this is a very important change so what exactly is responsible for this uh, expression of prolactin and development of placenta so options are special changes or temporal changes in hox a11 amino acid changes in hox a11 and special temporal changes in hox a11 expression there is only one option that is correct because this is a round type of answer okay so let us try and answer this so so uh, in only the placental mammals there is the hox a11 gene in them has the ability to combine with fox o1a in order to ex uh, promote expression of uterine prolactin enhancer so uh, we continue so we are discussing the ability of mammalian hox a11 proteins in combination with fox o1a to promote expression of uterine prolactin enhancer so in case of only the placental mammals the hox a11 gene is able to bind to fox o1 which is another gene that is being expressed in the same uterine region and both of them together can bind to the uterine prolactin enhancer and help in uh, enhancing expression of prolactin and this expression of prolactin in turn helps in the development of the placenta so uh, hox a11 of placental mammals has undergone various mutations such that it can interact with fox o1a and activate prolactin expression in uterine epithelial cells so in this particular uh, experiment they had tried and seen if uh, the it is essentially fox a11 that is responsible or it may be something else so what they did is that they took various hox a11 gene and tried to uh, uh, gauge the binding of hox a11 fox o1 to uh, uh, towards the prolactin enhancer and gauge the expression of prolactin after that so as you can see if it is just hox a11 or just fox o1a there is not much difference but if it is fox o1a and human hox a11 you see a very increased expression of prolactin similarly with the mouse a uh, hox a11 or eutherian fox a11 that uh, we have huge increases in pro prolactin expression but for therian uh, mammals such as opossum platypus or chicken that is birds which do not have a placenta if fox o1 and the uh, hox a11 combination of theirs do not give rise to this huge expression of prolactin and thus they do not have the development of placenta in them and hence the this indeed uh, the interaction between hox a11 and fox o1 that gives rise to this increased expression of prolactin and this in turn is only possible because of the expression of hox a11 uh, uh, due to the mutation in hox a11 which allows it to interact with fox o1 and again since it is a change in amino acid sequence that is changed in the type or kind of protein this is also an example of heterotypy so here we have the entire uh, caption to the image uh, uh, the, this particular figure shows the ability of mammalian hox a11 protein in combination of hox a1 to promote expression of uterine prolactin enhancer and this is shown using various combinations of hox a11 and hox a1 from 
uh, fox one a and hawks a eleven from different uh, species. Thus, which of the following is responsible for prolactin expression? For uh, prolactin expression in uterine epithelial cells of placental mammals, the responsible uh, changes amino acid changes in Hox A11. Okay. So, move forward and now discuss about the reaction diffusion model. The reaction diffusion model will probably provide the best explanation for which of the following. So, the reaction diffusion model is a model developed by Alan Turing uh, to explain how two separate independent stochastic changes in two the separate uh, reactants or compounds can give rise uh, or molecules give rise to change at overall change. So, that is something that we will see in the next slide. And thus, the reaction, uh, but the question asks us is the reaction diffusion model will provide the best explanation for which of the following. The options are why certain insects form fewer legs than the others, the cusp pattern of mammalian teeth, why the blowhole of veins form on the top of their skulls, and why the middle digit in all vertebrates is longer than its surrounding digits. So, uh, this is a box type of answer. So, more than one option is correct. So, I would like everyone to try and answer this. Okay, so let us try and answer this particular question. This is the reaction diffusion model that we are talking about that was uh, described by Alan Turing. So, uh, uh, here we are talking about morphogenetic constraints and how different uh, combination of morphogens can give rise to different relative concentration of uh, various cells that are being ex affected by the morphogen. So, although there have been many modifications of vertebrate limb over 300 million years, some modifications such as the middle digit shorter than the, its surrounding digits are never seen, indicating certain rules are involved in the development of these digits. And this was described by the reaction diffusion or Turing model of pattern generation. In this particular pattern generation, there are two, particular, uh, two chemicals or two reactants uh, which are uh, which have uh, specific characteristics. There is a reactant P which slowly diffuses, and uh, activate uh, P is an activator that stimulates production of inhibitor S, and it also stimulates the production of itself as well. S, in uh, on the other hand, diffuses quickly and inhibits autocatalysis of P. So S inhibits P. And what the diffusion model shows, as we can see right here, stochastic change in both of them gives rise to a pattern such as this, in which there will be only one peak of P surrounded by another only uh, pl flatter peak of S. This is what the reaction diffusion model tells, uh, tells us. There won't be any shoulder peaks of P, and there will be a peak of S that will be higher than P. So this is the shape that uh, comes out. If the if these two type of reactants interact with each other, so this model, after some changes, has been able to describe uh, the formation of cusps on top of teeth. So cusps are this crown-like structure that are present on teeth, and the formation of those has been explained using this model. So GIS analysis of gene activity in the formation of first set of cusps in mouth and whole molars. So expression patterns of MGF4 and SHH at a given stage predicts the cusp formation and what at one later stage, at the stage rate. So you see looking at the expression pattern at one stage, the scientists were able to 
predict the, how the expression pattern will look at a, the, the next stage using the uh, reaction diffusion model. So as you can see, the expression pattern changes like this. And with the respect to that, uh, such a structure of uh, four cusps occur in mouse. And the two reactants in this case are FGF4 and SHH or solid phase oil. So the reaction division model will probably provide base explanation of the cusp pattern of mammalian vertebrate uh, mammalian teeth and why the middle digit, digit in all vertebrates is longer than its surrounding digits. So that was what we had to explain regarding the reaction diffusion model. Let us move forward and look at which of the following is or are true of phylotypic stage. At the phylotypic stage, inductive events occur within individual modules. Phylotypic stage involves inductive events among different modules. Embryos of distantly related organisms of a given phylum display the highest resemblance at the phylotypic stage. And morphogenetic gradient dependent global events occur at the phylotypic stage. This is more than one correct option type of question, and uh, it's, as it's a box type of answer, and I would like everyone to try and answer this. So let us try and answer this. So there is a concept of phylotypic stage that uh, in a specific phylum, which tells us that in case of a sub phylum, there is one stage which will com be common for the entire phylum and uh, very similar between different for sub phylums between the phylum uh, in the entire phylum. And from that separate organisms will follow. So the late neuronal stage, which is known as pharyngula, is the phylotypic stage for the subphylum vertebrata. So at this stage, this stage will occur uh, uh, developmentally in all the organisms in the phylum itself. And this will be very similar across the phylum. And this uh, gives rise to a type of constraint on evolution, which is known as the phylotypic constraint. That is, since the more or less everything, uh, every one of the organisms developed from this particular, uh, this particular uh, phylotypic stage, changes to this particular phylotypic stage is not possible. And the paradigm of development that has been set up at this stage will be taken forward in later stages as well. So even though uh, it can go and perform something like a shard or elephant, various characteristics of the phylum at the phylotypic stage will be maintained and uh, it uh, that cannot be changed and this is known as the phylotypic constraint. So the thus this is uh, thus there is a mechanism for bottleneck at the pharyngular stage of vertebral development and this is because at the pharyngular stage itself what happens is that uh, separate developmental modules are interacting with each other in order to form the phylo phylotypic stage or the pharyngular stage. So we can see various development models such as A, B, C, D, E, F and G which are um, present throughout the pharyngula are interacting within each other in order to form local developmental modules. Now, if, uh, now at a later stage when the local modules have been set up slight changes in them can really lead to variation. But any changes which are done at this pharyngular stage will uh, affect the entire embryo and will probably destroy it. And thus this stage is uh, immutable and variations in this stage does not occur. If uh, variations have to occur, they occur at a later stage. And thus the developmental plan that has been set up here is a constraint for the evolution and variation later down the line uh, as development proceeds. And this is known as the phylotypic uh, bottleneck or the phylotypic constraint. And so the question is which of the following is or are true of the phylotypic stage? The correct options are phylotypic stage involves inductive event 
among different modules and embryos of distinctly related organisms of a given phylum display the highest resemblance at the phylotypic stage. So we move on to the next question. Among the following, and the options given below, identify the ones that is or are examples of phylotypic constraints. The options are all marsupials have shorter fold limbs, existence of phylotypic uh, stage, absence of rotating organs in any organism, or absence of 25 foot long in uh, leeches. So this is a more than one option correct type of answer. We would like everyone to try and answer this. Okay, we will try and answer this particular question. So first we will uh, get into my, uh, a little more detail about phyletic constraints. So these are historical restrictions based on genetics of development and are constraints imposed by inductive events at the phylotypic stage of development uh, such as the late uh, such as the parangular stage in case of body groups. And phyletic, uh, this is something that we have just discussed and uh, these can include presence of notochord in vertebrates, lack of variations among marsupial limbs, constraints on alternative body plans by the pleiotropic nature of insect, segment polarity genes, and involvement of Hox genes that specify cervical vertebrae in stem cell proliferation. So moving on, so uh, to answer this question, the options are, the options that are correct are all marsupials have shorter fold limbs is one of the phylotypic constraints and existence of a phylotypic stage. In case of marsupials, the thing is, in case of marsupials have to just after birth crawl into the mother's pouch in order to get uh, developed further, and thus the structure of the fold limbs at uh, that end is really very very important and cannot be altered, and thus uh, evolution has. Uh, there is the evolutionary constraint on the formation of the uh, fold limbs and the structure of the fold limbs remains the same throughout and thus this is a phyletic constraint. So we move on to the next question. Identify phyletic constraints that are commonly observed in development of organisms. The options are presence of notochord in vertebrates, law of diffusion in the circulation of blood throughout the body, lack of variation of uh, among limbs and involvement of Hox genes that uh, specify cervical vertebra in stem cell regeneration. I would like everyone to try and answer this. Okay, so I'll just try to answer this particular question. Uh, so as we have just seen, the phyletic constraints involve uh, involve the following options only, which are the presence of notochord in vertebrates and involvement of Hox genes that specify cervical vertebrae in stem cell regeneration. The other options do not qualify for uh, phyletic constraints. So we move on to the next question. If a longer limb is advantageous in a given environment, the humerus may grow longer. But the two smaller humeri joined together in tandem have never occurred, never occurred due to the options are their advantages in process of natural selection, physical constraints, morphogenetic constraints, or phylotypic constraints. So this is another question regarding the phylotypic constraint uh, concept. So you'd like everyone to try and answer this. Okay, so 
let us try and answer this question uh, so as we have seen again and again this but the, the developmental paradigm that does not change is majorly part of the phylogenetic change uh, stay, uh, due to the phylogenetic constraints and part of the uh, due to the constraints enforced on the particular organism at the phylogenetic stage and thus this will be uh, again we go back to the particular slide on phylogenetic constraint these are history these are the historical restrictions based on genetics of development and these involves the following examples that we have just discussed and thus uh, the two humeri not joining together in tandem is also part of the phylogenetic constraints so we move forward which of the following explains the frequent co-occurrences of an extra cervical limb rib and embryonic cancers so what is the reason for the formation in case of embryonic cancers as we will just see the data embryonic cancer in case of embryonic cancers there has been a lot increased formation of an extra cervical limb the question is what gives rise to this particular uh, gives rise to this particular cervical limb the options are genes involved in body patterning also play a role in regulation of stem cell proliferation phylogenetic constraints playing a role in development and evolution extra cervical ribs directly cause embryonic tumor and embryonic cancers directly cause growth of an extra cervical rib so we'll try and uh, go through this particular we'll try and go through this particular uh, slide and understand so here, here you can see that so here you can see that uh, in case of some organism uh, in case of uh, most childs born with uh, embryonic cancers there is a huge increased formation of a extra cervical limb. so this is the data that was uh, collected uh, for a large scale study and you can see that in case of many embryonic cancers such as neuroblastoma brain tumor lymphoma there is a, uh, we have a huge number which uh, have an extra cervical limb and this is a total childhood cancers that are uh, compared so in k out of 750 of such cases are was averaged out we have this many cervical limb extra cervical limbs being formed whereas in the general population the number is very very low so what is the reason for it so extra cervical limbs are associated with childhood cancers a radiogram shows us this extra limb that is uh, rib that is being formed and nearly 80% of fetuses with extra cervical ribs die before birth those surviving often develop cancers very early in life and this indicates strong selection against changes in number of mammalian cervical ribs so what is the reason for that the re major reason is that the hox gene that is involved in the formation of the extra cervical rib is also responsible for 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 maintenance of stem cell proliferation and thus if there is mutation in the hox gene we see the extra cervical limb but it also tells us about the underlying stem cell proliferation stem cell proliferation defects that are occurring and this in turn gives rise to the child uh, embryonic cancer and thus which of the following explains the frequent co occurrences of an extra cervical rib and embryonic cancer the answer is genes involved in body patterning also play a role in regulation of stem cell proliferation and phylogenetic constraints playing a role in development and evolution so this is a phylogenetic constraint that is uh, involved here that the hox gene that is being uh, that is responsible for the formation of cervical limb, uh, rib as well as stem cell proliferation cannot be mutated that is a phylogenetic constraint here and the gene involved in body patterning also play a role in regulation of stem cell proliferation is referring to the hox gene that i just talked about so this is uh, about this question we move forward to the next one the next question is what is polyphenism the options are it is a formation of different phenotypes conferred by apl it is the same as developmental plasticity 
it is the presence of a variety of phenotypes in a population and it is the ability of a given genotype to form different phenotypes in different environments so this is only one type of uh, one option current type of answer so this is a round type of answer so i would like everyone to try and answer this So we move on and try to answer this particular question. So we now we are talking about selectable epigenetic variation. So uh, variations that are uh, that get uh, that are introduced into the the evolution that are introduced without changes in the gene sequence itself. Those are known as epigenetic changes. So this uh, the idea of developmental plasticity. That is development of alternate phenotypes. Which is known as polyphenism for a given genotype, the specific phenotype being dependent on the environment. So the same genotype can give rise to various phenotypes depending on what the in, uh, uh, depending on the environment that is being encountered, and this is known as polyphenism. And development of plasticity allows epigenetic variations, which is stable in some instances between generations, and this is known as epigenetic inheritance system. So the epigenetic inheritance that developmental plasticity allows if it is able to be inherited in separate steps it is no separate generations which is known as epigenetic inheritance system and for our the question that we are answering polyphenism itself is the phenomenon of development of alternate or separate phenotypes from us the same genotype thus what is polyphenism it is the ability of a given genotype to form different phenotypes in a different environment. So we move on to the next question. Symbiont variation constitutes a system of epigenetic inheritance only when the symbiont is transmitted from one generation to the next via the germline. Horizontal gene transfer is possible among symbiont variants. Symbiont composition varies in relative abundance and the symbiont composition is influenced by the host gene. So a bit of context for this particular question. Symbiont organisms are, uh, are organisms that live along with the host and helps and uh, both the host and the symbiont help in the development of each other. So a very, very good example is the gut microbiota that we have in which there are very many good bacteria that represent that help in digestion and in turn have nutrition provided by the host organism itself. So, uh, similar variation can help in epigenetic inheritance by which, uh, in which of the following cases. So, this is a round type of answer, so only one option is correct. So, I would encourage anyone to try, uh, to try and answer this particular question. Okay. So, we move on and try to answer this particular question. So what is symbiont variation? Symbiont variation is variation in the symbiont composition. So the variation in the symbiont micro composition itself can give rise to variation in symbionts, uh, in the variation in inheritance pattern of them and it will help, uh, will create variations for evolution to select. So symbiotic microbes can provide greater adaptive potential than the host genome in the following way. Uh, symbionts change in relative abundance. So, if there are type A and type B symbiont present in the gut, the uh, so if we are talking about the microbes, maybe uh, type A amount will be greater in uh, in one case, or type B will be greater in another case, and that also provides uh, selection pressure on the introduction of a new symbiont, say a type C that is being introduced, and how it plays along with the other uh, microbiota present. Changes in microbial genome can occur much faster through recombination of or random mutation than in case of the host genome and these uh, changes occur much more rapidly in case of microbes. And the final one, horizontal gene transfer is possible in microbes. Thus, uh, the symbionts gives evolution another uh, set of selection pressure that can be applied in order to enforce evolution into a particular direction. Because symbionts uh, can give a variety of, as we can see from these four, op uh, 
for example symbiomes can give variety of uh, variety of options for evolution to select from but in case of uh, symbiont variation to be an epigenetic inheritance the main important point that we have to keep in mind is that symbiont needs to be transmitted from one generation to the next via the germline because in the if the adult has say for in case of us the host microbiota that won't be transferred to in the germline to the next generation but in other cases symbiont uh, symbionts can be transferred from one generation to the next and that then uh, comes under the epigenetic inheritance so we move forward which of the following statements is true in the construct context of genetic assimilation the options are phenotypic characteristics produced initially in response to environmental influences genotypic characteristics produced initially in response to environmental influences phenotype is expressed in the absence of an external stimulus phenotype is expressed only in the presence of external stimulus this is more than one option correct kind of answer because we have box type of answer so for context genetic assimilation is a type of inheritance in which uh, it's a, uh, it is part of polyphenism in which let's say due to a particular environmental selection pressure if a particular genotype could have expressed a b c three different phenotypes only one is getting selected over and over in various generations what will happen after uh, subsequent generations is even without in the absence of the environmental stimulus or the environmental trigger the genotype will um, start expressing that phenotype more abundantly than the others this is known as genetic assimilation so let us try and answer this particular question so genetic assimilation is the process by which a phenotypic character initially produced only response to some environmental influence becomes through a process of selection taken over by genotype so that it is formed even in the absence of environmental influence that had been necessary thus in short phenotype precedes the genotype in this case so in order to describe or, uh, or correctly assess this particular claim various experiments were done one of which was uh, using drosophila that had four wings so uh, in this particular expression what was done is uh, they had taken uh, bithorax mutants uh, or added a particular chemical that will uh, produce bithorax mutants and if you remember correctly bithorax mutants have four wings so what they did is that they took uh, a bithorax mutants and after the experiment they saw that some flies still produced two wings and some flies still produced four wings because uh, some in some cases the bithorax uh, gene was mutated and thus there was four wings and in some cases it was not and so some drosophila were two wings what they did is that they took the two wings and four wings separately and mated among uh, themselves and thus this above line shows the crosses between only four wing drosophila and these showed only among two wings and after a while they uh, saw that uh, as they had selected for the four wing phenotype even if the particular mutation uh, mut mutagen was removed the, since they had selected for the trait on uh, this particular uh, fly line majorly produced only four wing drosophila that is the uh, this particular mutagen's effect or stimulus was genetically assimilated and in the other case so in the uh, where only two winged drosophila were being generated in that fly line when the you know, see, uh, selection pressure was removed it still went on to form the two winged drosophila that is in uh, that case also the genetic assimilation was taking place but only in case to uh, in order to form the two winged fly this is further explained in this particular uh, experiment in which they had seen uh, a range of larva which uh, changed color in response to heat so here when they were they gave a heat shock it changed to black and if it did not so this is the property of the larva itself and if they did not 
so and if they did give a heat shock and the lava did not produce any change in color if they give it a higher score so they scored the uh, ability of the larva to change color so they scored the ability of the larva to change color from a, a score of 0 to 4 uh, so the range of larval coloration observed in heat shock larva of black mutants the number below it represents the scoring system used to quantify the color change 0 is completely black and 4 is completely green non heat shock black mutant and not heat shock wild mutant of larvae of m sexta have the phenotypic scores 0 and 4 respectively so uh, this was uh, how they scored and what they next did is they only crossed between the heat shock black mutant and the heat shock uh, green mutant. So the lower scoring mutants and higher scoring mutants were crossed amongst themselves separately. And what we saw is that changes in coloration of heat shock larva in response to it, selection for increased green and decreased black color response to heat shock treatments and the no selection is given in blue color. After crossing uh, in separate generations, it was seen that even after the heat shock stimulus was removed, this particular polyphenic green line went on to produce green uh, green mutants, a uh, uh, green progeny, and the black uh, line was uh, went on to pro uh, produce black larva. This shows uh, gives us another case in which the genetic assimilation. That is, even when the external stimulus of heat shock is removed, the generation, uh, the genotype now takes over and it forms a phenotype without any stimulus from outside. This is entirely what is known as genetic assimilation. And uh, we have here responses on the color scheme and a correlation between them, which also shows, uh, shows the same. Thus, which of the following statements are true in context of? genetic assimilation, the phenotypic characteristics produced initially in response to environmental influences and the phenotype is expressed in absence of the external stimulus. So we move on to the next one. Which of the following are not advantages of developmental plasticity contributing to genetic assimilation of morphs? The options are the phenotype is prevalent in the population the phenotype is not prevalent in the population, the phenotype is random and the phenotype is not random. This is more than one option correct, box set for answer, I would like you to try and answer this. Okay. So, if environmentally induced phenotypes are genetically assimilated, they are advantageous in case the phenotype is not random, that is the phenotype gives uh, helps the particular organism to survive and the phenotype already exists in a large portion of the population. In these two cases is when genetic uh, assimilation is advantageous to the organism and the evolution depends on population genetics to identify and quantify the dynamics of the change in the entire population and developmental biology to show that how any specific mutation can be manifest as a selectable phenotype. So in these two cases if the phenotype is not random and the phenotype already exists in a large group of a portion of the population is when the genetic assimilation is helpful for the organism and thus which of the following are not advantages of development plasticity contributing to gen uh, genetic assimilation of morphs the option are the phenotype is not prevalent in the population and the phenotype is random in both of these cases the genetic assimilation will not be helpful for the organism. Next, we deal with uh, matching the following type of question. We have to match the options A, B, C and D to the options 1, 2, 3 and 4. So these are, uh, these are uh, the terms in 1, 2, 3 and 4 and these are the definition of the term that we have to match. So the first one is the phenomenon of diverse species resembling each other at a particular stage in development and this is known as the phenotypic bottleneck as we have just learned the phenomenon of presence of multiple phenotypes for a given genotype is polyphenism the ability of a gene to play different roles in different cells 
is known as pleiotropic. So this is a term that we had dealt in our lecture a bit uh, back when we had uh, when we were discussing uh, the small tool toolkit and the various pathways or that are very important for development in biology. And the final one is variance of chromatin structure can be inherited between generations. So since chromatin structure is not a uh, change in the DNA sequence, it is an epigenetic change and this gives rise to epi alleles. So the correct option is A3, B, B1, or C, Four and D two, which is number two, the number one. Yes. A three B one C four D two. This is number one. So this is the correct option. So that was all I had for today. I uh, thank everyone for joining this particular session. And the references to the slides is introduction to development of biology by Scott Gilbert, the ninth edition. This is a YouTube link on which the all the videos of the uh, that are being recorded are being uploaded. This will also be. And this was our final PMRF NPTEL session for this NPTEL course. I thank everyone that joined the session and participated it. I wish that uh, everyone who did, were, did not get the opportunity to join, they will go through the various videos on YouTube in order to better understand the concepts and uh, have uh, have the extra help. In order to tackle the assignment problems that were given throughout the course, I uh, so this is the last thing, this is the last week's material that we are going to discuss. The next, uh, the NPTEL exam is coming up next week. I wish everyone who is going to appear for the NPTEL exam the best of luck, and I also wish anyone, uh, everyone, a uh, very best of luck for your future endeavors. I thank everyone for joining this particular session. Thank you.